What's up, everybody? I'm the Goji Ryu Philosopher, and today I'd like to discuss something that I'm fairly certain will become very contentious. A lot of people train karate for, at least in part, the self-defense benefit that knowing a martial art can give you. Not every self-defense technique taught in every karate class works. For instance, I can tell you right now that you probably won't need that escape from wrist grab that you spent half an hour drilling unless your assailant is some sort of walking stereotype of a street fighter. However, martial arts aren't ineffective at self-defense by any stretch. You can find hundreds of examples of people using judo throws, BJJ submissions, and boxing or karate strikes to end street fights or restrain belligerent people. But I would like to argue for a second that any type of violence in a self-defense situation is bad. It's pretty obvious that the objective in self-defense situations is to avoid injury and get out of the dangerous situation. After all, you're trying to defend yourself, not to injure your assailant or to show off your fighting skills. Nevertheless, most self-defense classes and martial arts instruction focuses on the small part of self-defense that involves violence. It's very rare to see a self-defense class that includes conflict de-escalation skills, situational awareness, or even how to skate with your head up so that you don't get into a dangerous situation in the first place. They're out there, but they are very rare, and often contain questionable or just bad information. In this video, I'm going to try to argue that violence is an absolutely awful way to go about defending yourself, and that it should only be saved for the last resort, for when you can't get out of a situation without being injured, and that even then you need to be very cautious about using it. I've structured this video to go from what I feel is my least convincing argument to my most convincing argument. Even with all these considerations, I do still think that there is a place in self-defense for actually fighting, but I hope that these arguments will get you thinking about when violence is and isn't acceptable. Let's get started. This is both an obvious argument and a fairly weak one for most people. Violence is immoral and should be avoided whenever possible. I intend to go more into depth about the philosophy of violence and how it relates to karate in a future video about the most famous proverb in karate, karate ni sente nashi, or there is no first strike in karate. For now though, my position is that violence is only acceptable when it's in the service of preventing a direct threat of larger violence. It can be hard to tell in a self-defense situation just how violent the assailant is willing or able to get. If your would-be attacker could be dissuaded by just a small amount of pain compliance, or even just by talking them down, is it really defensible to strike them, take them to the ground, or even knock them out? It can also be very hard to tell when someone has been knocked out or has given up in a street fight. I've seen videos of street fights where one person had to be pulled off of the other despite having knocked them out or having forced them to turtle up. When you go into the excessive force territory, your actions stop being self-defense and start just being their own violence. However, on its own, this isn't necessarily the best argument against violence in self-defense. So let's go to my next point, which is... Simply put, violence is usually not the most efficient way of keeping yourself safe. Even when you consider situations that reach the level of danger where you might want to throw a punch, a lot of the time your best bet is to try conflict de-escalation through one of several methods. Trying to fight someone takes an amount of time, and it will tire you out, making any escape attempts later that much more difficult. If you're in a position where running away is viable, it's usually better to start by trying to run away and only throw a strike if you need to in order to open up the opportunity for you to get out of there. De-escalation is a very broad term for a lot of types of behavior that you can use to avoid having to throw hands, not all of which I'm super qualified to talk about. However, a few examples might be talking to someone who's being belligerent and explaining that you're not looking for a fight, or complying with any requests that you might be given. The second technique is especially useful if there's a weapon involved, because you really don't want to let a situation escalate to violence when there's a weapon involved. In general though, using your de-escalation skills takes a lot less time, energy, and is a lot lower risk than trying to fight someone. If there's anything scarier than getting gassed, it's getting gassed in an actual fight where your opponent won't go easy on you or stop when a ref tells them to. De-escalating a fight can be pretty embarrassing, and if you're being mugged or robbed, it can also involve losing property such as your wallet or your phone. However, losing a few hundred dollars and having to replace your IDs, or getting insulted a little, is always much preferable to getting injured or even losing your life. And as the next point we'll go into a little more detail about, when a self-defense situation turns violent, you're gambling with both your health and your safety. It should go without saying that fighting is dangerous. If you're fighting, your opponent will probably fight back with whatever resources they have. There's a common assumption that black belts or martial arts practitioners in general are safe in street fights due to their experience or practice. 
This is sort of true, since having practice will definitely reduce your risk and let you understand how to stay as safe as possible. Assuming your training is evidence-based and you have some pressure testing in your practice, you're likely to fare a lot better in self-defense as a martial artist than you would as an ordinary person. And even taking part in regular exercise will make things easier, since your stamina and pain tolerance will be higher than someone who doesn't exercise regularly. However, I've sparred with quite a few people in my life, and if you've been doing martial arts for enough time, you've probably done the same. One thing that I've learned in that time is that even a complete amateur can land a strike every now and then. Even a BJJ white belt can jam a black belt's shoulder while rolling, even if it's by accident. Even a student on their first class can pop you in the face if they're lucky or if you underestimate them. The truth of the matter is, when you're in an active fight, there's always the risk that you will get hurt, and the longer a fight goes on, the more likely you are to get hurt seriously. That's why a lot of striking competitions like boxing or kyokushin prioritize knockouts or knockdowns, because those will finish a fight before it has time to go on long enough to get you hurt as well. This goes especially for situations with multiple attackers or where your attacker has a weapon. When violence starts, you have to assume that you will get hurt and act accordingly. If you're focused on pulling off your own self-defense technique, you might miss your chance to run away and get hurt as a result. Much of the time, when someone has pulled a weapon on you, they're attempting to intimidate you into compliance, and they may not want to use force at all if they can avoid it. Just like how you're statistically more or less guaranteed to get hurt if violence breaks out, they're also very likely to get injured, and they want to avoid this. This means that, even more than situations where a weapon isn't involved, you have a good way to avoid getting hurt. However, when someone has a weapon, you have to be extra careful even if you are complying with them. Since it's a high-tension situation, if you make a sudden movement, reach for your pocket without warning, or attempt to throw your wallet and purse, you might cause them to panic and attack, since they might assume that you're attacking. Be very careful. But there's one more, even more important reason to avoid violence and self-defense, which is... So why did I put this at the end of the video as my most important argument? Well, there are a couple of reasons, which will take some explaining, but are worth it. First off, I want to point out where I got the advice that I closed out the last section with. I've been told that if ever pulled over by the police, I ought to keep my hands visible on the wheel of my car, make no sudden movements, and announce that I'm reaching for my wallet and ID when I do so, so as to avoid them viewing me as a threat. In fact, I've had to use this advice when a local sheriff's deputy was falsely called on me for some canvassing work that I was doing. During this situation, my phone went off in my pocket, and the deputy started to reach for his gun before my coworker defused the situation. I was extra careful in presenting my ID after that. And in this situation, I was both legally in the right and completely nonviolent. Imagine how problems might escalate if the situation is ambiguous, or if I wasn't a relatively clean-cut and well-educated white person. Self-defense is a legally protected form of violence. Various laws across the United States and other countries may protect your right to use violence defending your person, your property, your family, or innocent bystanders. However, self-defense has to be justified, and what counts as reasonable justification can vary at the discretion of law enforcement and the courts. Even if your use of violence is ruled as justified, you may still have to go to civil or criminal court and prove that justification, which can be a messy and expensive, not to mention time-consuming, process. Not to mention, this is a situation where you're all but guaranteed to face steeper obstacles if you're a martial artist of color. Now, as far as I can tell, unless you're in Guam, your martial arts training is not supposed to impact the legal status of self-defense. However, if you know martial arts, this can still be unofficially used to show that your actions went beyond the definition of justified self-defense. Certain jurisdictions also have stand-your-ground laws and castle doctrines, which can be used to justify violent self-defense either in public or in your home, respectively, even if retreat was a safe option. However, there are several prominent cases where this defense was either successfully used to justify actions that many don't consider self-defense, or where it was unsuccessful in justifying self-defense. There are a few studies that indicate that this defense may also be more difficult for people of color to use, although this is contested. When you use violence and self-defense, you're increasing the likelihood that police will be asked to deal with the case, and that is not always safe for you, even if you feel like you have a rock-solid case for self-defense. Legal difficulties can and will rain down on you, not to mention the potential that the police may use force in arresting you or bringing you in for questioning, which is force that you cannot defend yourself against without risking resisting arrest charges. 
Your chances of being prosecuted or harassed by the police also rise sharply if you're a person of color, but even if this isn't the case, there's still a load of legal trouble involved in defending yourself. Please stay safe. This video has been a simple rundown of the reasons why I feel that using violence in self-defense is a bad gamble. Even with all that I've just said though, there are still some situations where you might need to use your martial arts to keep yourself safe. Hopefully though, these arguments will make you more cautious and judicious about fighting in self-defense. If you're interested in learning some common myths about self-defense techniques and how to improve your chances of staying safe in an actual fight, I've put some videos by channel Hard to Hurt in the description that I think are excellent at debunking these harmful myths. Thank you for watching through to the end, and I hope you found this video fun and interesting. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and leave a comment if you have any perspectives I may have overlooked, especially as pertains to the legal challenges of trying to defend yourself. While you're down there, you can subscribe to this channel to see more videos like this when they come out, and if you do so, make sure to hit the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and once again, stay safe out there.